Well, you may or may not have heard the word YOLO before. Uh, became popular in 2012 when uh, a rapper uh, started a song or sang a song in which he talked about how you only live once. That's the motto, YOLO. Um, and in the context of this song, this, uh, this rapper talks about taking pleasure in life. Um, and it's not, uh, not the cleanest song, but I am well acquainted with it because at the time that it came out, I was teaching in Oklahoma City. And I knew that in my classroom or maybe in the hallway during passing periods, if I heard someone yell the word YOLO, I needed to look for a flying projectile. Um, believe it or not, they uh, listened to the song and they interpreted uh, the rap artist Drake to mean when you only live once, you should do crazy things at school. And with the type of students that I was teaching, the homes that they came from, this was not entirely surprising when something would fly across the room. In fact, I learned as a teacher to write like this on the board so that I could keep an eye on students while I was also teaching them. And when I heard the word YOLO, if I was looking away, my head would snap around real quick and I would look for whoever had something in their hand to throw. You only live once. And of course, I would try and turn this around and say, you know, you guys are right. You do only live once. And so you should think about what you're living for, what your life is being pushed towards, what you are hoping for, what your goals are, how you're pursuing those dreams. Maybe you need to think about the family that you'll have down the road and how it's important that you have a good education so that you can earn a good income for them because you only live once. Now, oftentimes that message fell on deaf ears, but I like to think that maybe one or two of my students picked it up and uh, they're now living a, a responsible life and caring for people that, that they are charged to care for. But we all have our own YOLO moments, and I don't mean in a good way. Uh, we maybe make impulsive purchases and uh, sort of mess up our finances a little bit, or maybe we make impulsive relationship decisions when we're upset at someone about something. Maybe we make uh, decisions about our physical health. Maybe we push ourselves a little bit too hard when we ought to know better uh, because we think you only live once and I want to live my life the way that I will live it. We might not, we might not yell the word YOLO, but we have that sort of mindset on occasion. We think I want this, so I'm going to get it. And we don't always think through the decisions that we're going to make. And this is why one of my favorite quotes from philosophers, I studied philosophy at Baylor, and one of the classical philosophers, Plato, is famous for saying, the unexamined life is not worth living. If you only live once, then you ought to think carefully about what it is that you're living for, what it is you are striving towards, what your life is aiming for. And, I, you know, I'm not great at this either sometimes. I make bad decisions. I make impulsive purchases. I, I say things maybe I shouldn't say at times uh, because my emotions get the best of me. Or I decide that I want to do something right then, no matter the effect it might have on my longer-term goals. In fact, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was reminded of a, a little page that I had made. It's a personal goal page. Mid-December of last year, I sat down and I wrote some goals that have been kind of in my mind for a while, and I decided, you know, maybe 2021 is the year that I'll finally pursue these goals. And so there are three little columns on this page. One of them is uh, for my guitar, learning to play the guitar a little bit better. One of them is for biblical Greek, translating more of Scripture from the original language into English. And one of them is for weightlifting and to lift specific weights on particular lifts. And so I wrote these all down mid-December, right? And then uh, July 4th, I wrote, I have abandoned all of these. <laughs> because I got sidetracked, right? I started thinking about other things. Maybe my goals were a little too ambitious to begin with. But I didn't really stay focused on these. I had other things in my life come up, and these remained unexamined. And this is what happens when we think YOLO, right? When we come up with other things that uh, keep our 
attention. It's hard to keep our sights on what we really want or what matters most. And we get lost letting life run the details of our calendar and the desires of our hearts. We do things because other people do them. We seek after things because other people have them. And we eventually look back in some domains of our life and we say, I have abandoned what I really wanted. I have abandoned the things that I was really seeking after. And we realize, you know what, I only live once. And Jesus today is going to instruct us on this idea of living once, on thinking about what it is that we're actually pursuing. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 14. If you don't have a physical Bible with you, I would commend to you the YouVersion app, which is a Bible app widely used and uh, well kept by the engineers who've created it. And today in Luke chapter 14, we're going to begin in verse 25. Jesus has just left uh, a Pharisee's house where he was having a meal. And we looked at one of the passages from that meal last week. Uh, Jesus at the Pharisee's house talks about uh, believing in people over Sabbath policies and caring for those people. He talked about humbling ourselves, which is the passage we looked at last week. And he talked about people getting invited to his kingdom, and he used the metaphor of a banquet, people being invited to have dinner at this banquet, and the things that distract people from coming to the banquet. And so in continuing this theme of distraction, Jesus today is going to talk to us about counting the cost. So again, we'll look at verses 25 through 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, it's easy to get thrown off when we read these words from Jesus about hating people. Hate your mother, hate your children, hate your wife, brothers and sisters. It, and, you know, we read this and we think, is this the same Jesus who told us to love our neighbor? Right? I'm supposed to love my neighbor, even love my enemy and pray for those who persecute me, but I'm supposed to hate my mom? That doesn't seem to make any sense, Jesus. I don't understand exactly what's going on here. And this is where I think it's helpful to have the parallel passages from other Gospels. So Matthew records this teaching from Jesus as well, but he uses slightly different words. So Matthew in chapter 10 of his Gospel says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And this is the key verse from Matthew. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus is telling us how to prioritize our lives. And you know, I think the impulse when we read passages like this is to feel guilty, to ask ourselves, you know what, am I prioritizing my life correctly, or am I getting things out of order? And guilt starts to creep in, and we think, oh no, maybe God's not pleased with me because I'm not putting things in the right order. But I don't think that Jesus intends for us to just feel guilty. He's not trying to place guilt on our hearts. In fact, recently I was listening to one of the pastors I listen to frequently, and he was sharing a sermon on a different topic, and he gave the analogy of, Uh, You know, the Bible talks about God as our father. And what does a good parent want from their children? He said a, a good parent ultimately doesn't want anything from their children. A good parent wants things for the children. And so as I was reading this passage, I started to think, you know, this certainly sounds like God wants things from me, wants me to examine my relationships, wants me to think about what I have put first in my life. So it sounds to me like God wants something from me. And I was trying to square these two ideas and put them together. And then I thought about my relationship with my own children, with Jude and Micah, 
And they're both certainly of the age where they receive discipline. We ask them to do certain things or not do other things. And I think most people watching those scenarios would say, yeah, Ben wants something from his children. He wants them to be respectful. He wants them to listen when they're instructed on how to do something. He wants them to be kind to each other. And he wants them to be thankful when something is given to them. Those are things that you might say, I want from my children. And Jesus here makes it sound like he wants from us to prioritize our lives correctly, to think about whether we love other people more than we love the Lord himself. But the reason that God wants those things from us, and the reason I want from my children for them to be respectful and to be thankful and to be disciplined is because I want for them something that's down the road. I want them when they're teenagers and when they're young adults to be respectful, not because I merely want that from them, but because I know that if they are respectful to others, it will pave the way for easier doors in their life. I want for them a more successful life than I can imagine. And so I want from them hard work. I want for them to be able to get along well with others. And so I want from them respect for myself and their mother. In the same way, God wants the best for you. And so these small passages where it sounds like God expects something from us, ultimately it is for us. In fact, I was reading just this week an article about a biblical theology of pleasure what this man talked about. And in Genesis 1, the very beginning of Scripture, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God created a good world. He created you in his sight. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And in Psalm 104, the psalmist says, You, Lord, cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. This God, who is for you, who wants good things for you and for me, sent his own Son, to walk the earth and to show us how to live and then to sacrifice his own life to fix what had to be fixed. He gave his life for you. Jesus in this passage today goes on to give two metaphors about counting the cost in your life, about examining what it is that matters most to you. Verses 28 through 32. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. So we have two very different metaphors given to us by Jesus. We've got this sort of average Joe guy who's building a tower. Presumably anyone in the crowd is capable of building this tower, maybe a small tower. And Jesus asks, won't they sit down and count the cost of material? And those of you who've maybe been building a home or in the construction business know that the cost of materials can change. And we've seen that change over the last year when the cost of wood has skyrocketed. And so Jesus here gives this metaphor of the man who's building a tower. Things might change down the road. He needs to examine whether he can really pay for the materials, whether he can afford the house or the tower that he's going to build. And then there's this king who's going out into battle, and he's, in, he's going to have to count his 
soldiers to examine whether they're strong enough to take on a bigger army. Both of these people are looking at their, their resources. It's a type of resource capability calculation. A resource capability calculation. What resources do I have and how far can they get me where I want to go? And this type of thing is difficult in our own lives, counting the cost, looking at our resources. That's why we fall off of our goals sometimes, because we fail to look adequately or correctly at our resources. And so we miss what we're aiming for. And in fact, I, I think about when it comes to making commitments and counting the cost, I'm reminded of one of my seminary, seminary professors, uh, famous world-renowned ethicist San, Stanley Hauerwas. And in one of my classes with him, he asked a question of the students. And he said, should people be held morally responsible for something when they do not know what they are doing? And of course, all the students would say, well, well no, we don't think somebody should be held responsible if they don't know what they're doing. They should maybe have an idea of what's happening, and then they can be held responsible. And then he said, why do we expect people to stay married if that is your answer? Because nobody knows what it means to commit their entire life to another person. No one has lived a full life. Nobody can know the difficulty that's coming. It's difficult to count the cost. And Jesus here is telling us, look, things are going to come that will be difficult. And so you need to examine your life, examine the resources that you have, and ask yourself, can I really make this commitment to follow after Jesus? Jesus isn't just trying to scare us away, but he's trying to give us a true understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. Because after all, he wants what is best, ultimately best for us. Even if it sounds like he's asking a lot from us. We often think we know what it means to follow Jesus. But situations in our lives change. Politics change, culture changes, and then all of a sudden it looks a little different than it did years prior when we made the decision to follow Jesus. And Jesus doesn't want to sugarcoat what this decision looks like. He wants you to know that it might be hard at times. He goes on in verses 33 through 35. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. I think just like Jesus in telling us to hate our mothers and brothers and sisters and wives and fathers and mothers. I don't think this is a literal commandment. You might not literally be called to give up everything. There will be some of you who are called to go somewhere else, to sell everything but the clothes on your back, and to go to tell people about the Lord. And that is a commendable thing. And I pray that our church would support such a person who made that decision. But many of you will maintain your businesses. You will continue working. Students, you'll continue on in school. And so what is Jesus saying to those of us who continue our normal, everyday lives and don't give up everything in a literal sense? I think Jesus is telling us here that we need to see everything that we have, all of our resources, all of our gifts, all of our talents, as being used for him to build towers in his kingdom and to go to battle against evil in this world, to fight for the spread of the gospel. Whether it's while you're at work and the way you do your job, the way you run your business, you can show the Lord to others. Maybe in the way that you rest or go on vacation, you can use that to be drawn more into the Lord, to learn more about him, to rest in him, and to share with others about him. Maybe 
when your income is better some years, you can find someone to bless and to share about Jesus with as you bless them. Maybe you've been given unique abilities that you can use to further the gospel. Maybe you will walk through difficulties that the Lord can use in your life to show you his glory and his power so that you might walk through those same difficulties with others. Whatever the Lord gives to you, whether it seems good at the time or seems ill at the time, the Lord has given you that so that you might use it for his glory and for, ultimately, your good. Because that is what God wants for you. Some of us, some of you, might literally die for the gospel. This was the story of most of the apostles, the men who followed Jesus from day one of his ministry. They went on to tell others about Jesus, to travel to different places, to go through conflict about the gospel, and then to suffer brutal deaths at the hands of those who did not want them to share about the gospel. But that wasn't the case for every apostle. John, who wrote the gospel according to John, who wrote the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, who wrote the book of the Revelation. John wrote the book of the Revelation when he was in exile. John likely died a normal death, an average human death while he was in exile. Might have lived into his 90s, some people think. But John used every moment, every resource he had available to him to share the gospel, to make the Lord known to others. John had counted the cost. And even though he did not literally give up his life, in the form of death. He gave up every moment in his life for the Lord. God asks all of our resources. He asks everything from us so that we can seek and pursue what is most valuable for us because that is what God wants. And it's easy to get stuck on what he asks from us and fail to see what's even bigger, and that's what he has for us at the end of all things. And there may be times in your life when you experience those blessings before the end of all things. It brought me great joy this week to see our preteens worship the Lord, to learn about him, to get to our small group time and to ask questions about scripture and about God and to hear their answers, to see them be so involved in the discussion. That was a great blessing to me, and I know it was a blessing to our other sponsors. And that was a very small sacrifice going to camp. Something small for me that God asked from me. Something a little bit bigger for our sponsors who maybe took time off of work, took time that they could have used doing other things. Bigger for them that God asked from them. But I have no doubt that God has given to them because he wants good for them in that sacrifice that they made. So when we think about our resources, when we examine our lives and the things that we have, what God is asking from us, what Jesus here is telling us that we're called to sacrifice, to give all of ourselves, I started to ask, what is the biggest resource that we all have? What's the biggest thing that God can use in our lives? And I think the biggest resource for all of us, the most valuable resource we have is our time. The Lord wants you to use all of your time for his glory and for your good. We give time to people. We give time to hobbies, to goals that we want to pursue. We give time to work. But if you only live once, don't you want to orient all of those things 
to the one singular thing that matters most? Don't you want to give all of yourself, all of your gifts, all of your time to the Lord God Almighty? Not merely because he asks that from you, but because he wants for you to pursue the things worth pursuing most. And I'm not just telling you to be at church more. That's not the thing that I want you to take away from today. Is church good? Yes. Is it good to be around this community and to be reminded the things that we should seek after most? Absolutely. And I hope that the people in this room really are your community. Not just people you see on Sundays, but people that you can call. People that will pick you up off of a track after you've pulled your hamstring. People that will examine you to see if you're fit to go to preteen camp. And people that will pray for you while you're walking through difficulty. I do hope that you spend time with this community. But the bigger thing that I would want you to take away from today is that you spend time with the Lord on a daily basis. That you take 10 minutes out of your day. If you can't do 10, do five. If you can't do five, do two. Start with one of those. But every single day, spend time in prayer. Spend time reading scripture. Spend time telling somebody else what God is doing in your life. Give the Lord your time because that is your most valuable resource. You can cry out to God. You can yell at God. If you don't believe me, read the book of Job. Read some of the Psalms. God will listen to you. And he might even respond to your yelling. You only live once. You can throw all of your life into pleasure or you can find all of the purpose and good that God has for you. This week, set aside some time. Put your phone away. Put your computer away. Silence those things. If you're a parent, I would encourage you to do it maybe before the kids wake up or after they go to bed. And if you're a parent, I would encourage you to do things with your children, to read scripture with your children, to pray with your children to share the gospel with them, to spend time with the Lord together as a family. You know, the, I mentioned my goal sheet previously that I gave up on July 4th. On the back of my sheet is my number one goal, to love my family well. And I was glad when I was feeling discouraged about my goals and how I'd abandoned them. I wondered if I was some type of serial quitter. And I was able to write on this side, I've maintained this. I've not given up on this one. And it wasn't because I'm some great family man or I'm a great dad or a great husband. If you dig enough with Hannah, you'll find the things that I still need to work on. But at the top of this page, I put two verses that were good reminders for me last December. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 6.4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do you know that maybe two weeks ago, I was having a difficult morning. Maybe I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I was a little frustrated about who knows what, probably something I didn't need to be frustrated about. But I decided to uh, get the boys' little Bible and read with them anyway. You know, I felt like even though I'm frustrated, I need to read with them scripture. And they can't, they can't tell that I'm frustrated. They're not good enough at reading emotions yet to know that I'm frustrated. And they won't know, but they'll know that we didn't read the Bible. And so I sit down with Jude and Uh, We always read two Bible stories, and so I read the two Bible stories and close the Bible and start to walk away, and I still remember where I was standing. And Jude says, hey, Daddy, do you know that Jesus died so we don't have to? And it struck me. My son doesn't quite understand what those words mean yet, 
He's still learning, still growing, but he has heard them spoken by his mother, by me, by people in those Sunday school rooms, on Wednesday nights, when some of you come over to our house. And that is what matters most. Who cares about the other side of that page? Because that is what I want for my children. It is what God wants for them. No matter what it might seem like, I want from them. No matter what it might seem like, God wants from you. He ultimately wants for you. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks that you want the best for us, that you love us, that you care for us. God, we pray that when it seems like you want a lot from us, God, that we would see what Jesus gave, how he gave all of himself, and how he just wants to be honest with us about what it might mean to be a Christian. And Lord God, we thank you that ultimately Jesus has done what had to be done. And we pray, God, that you would ignite in our hearts a love for you, the, the desire to give you all of ourselves, because we know in giving you all of ourselves, we receive all of the blessings that you have for us, whether they come in this life or not, Lord, whether this life brings us struggle or joy. We know that ultimately in giving ourselves to you, that you have what's best in store for us. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you.